Welcome to another episode of the Construction of Leading Edge podcast. My name is Todd DeWalt, and this is the podcast for construction leaders. And today's going to be a little different. Um, I want to talk about a realization I had recently, and uh, which is uh, leading up to a new focus for the podcast. And um, so it's going to be a little different today. It's just going to be me sharing some some information that I realized recently and is uh, changing the course of Construction Leading Edge and how we go forward. So uh, I've been doing a lot of research over the past couple of months and um, there's quite a few problems in the construction industry, some of which I've experienced personally, some of which you may have experienced as well. For example, I found that less than 40% of construction businesses survive the first five years of business. the reality is a lot of contractors are really good at doing work, whether it's plumbing or landscaping or um, electrical work or whatever the case may be, building houses. But frankly, they're just not good at the business side of it. Um, I've, I've also found an interesting report that a lot of successful contractors fail because they're successful. So it's kind of like this... Um, Darned if you do, darned if you don't. There's a lot of contractors who, who are struggling because they're not successful and they go out of business because they can't make ends meet. But then on the other side, there are contractors who are successful and because of that success, they take their eye off the ball. They uh, get hungry to grow into areas they shouldn't and as a result of their success, they fail. Um, if you want that report, you can go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash red flags and there's a report there of some of the red flags of how or why successful contractors self-destruct. Interesting stuff there. Um, so let's, it made me think, what happens when, when a construction company goes out of business? What happens when they fail? There's lots of problems. There's this cascade effect uh, that, that hits, this ripple effect that happens when a contractor goes out of business. Um, Generally, there are suppliers who have outstanding bills. They don't get paid, so they take a hit. The banks take a hit. They have loans that can't be paid back. The surety companies have to step in. That takes a hit, and what that does is causes everybody else's claims. Uh, It has an impact on everybody else that works with that surety company. Um, the, The individuals who worked for that construction company, they've lost their job, in some cases suddenly without any warning. So they can't pay their bills, they can't make their house payment, they can't make their car payment, they have uh, foreclosure, repossession, um, has an impact on their family. So there's this cascade effect uh, that happens when when contractors go out of business. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my story in, in a few minutes, what happened with my construction business. But first, I want to tell you about this realization I had. You know, I've been I've been talking about leadership in the construction industry uh, for about the last year, fourteen months or so, and I've been really interested in, in leadership for the past several years. Read a lot of books, follow a lot of people on leadership. But I realized that um, well, I had this. It reminded me of a situation when I was in college. I had a roommate, one of my best friends, and he was a math major. He he had a, he was pursuing a math degree at the University of Kentucky with me, and I was pursuing an engineering um, degree. And we had, this, uh, we had this constant argument that I would say it was my position that uh, math majors really didn't do that much because all they talked about was theory and equations, and at the end of the day, all they had were numbers on paper. It was the engineers who actually took that stuff and made stuff happen. It's the engineers who actually took calculus and geometry and trigonometry and built stuff with it. And and his argument was, well, yeah, that's great, but without math, you engineers wouldn't be able to do anything. So we had this this back and forth. And it it made me realize that uh, there's a lot of talk about leadership out there in the space these days. There's lots of people on social media who are leaders, thought leaders, leadership gurus. Uh, you know, frankly, I wonder about some of these folks. How how much leadership, how much of a leadership guru can a twenty two year twenty two year old person be who's never had a leadership position? Makes you wonder. Um, but I realized that 
the, the purpose of leadership is to solve real problems. You know, Winston Churchill was a great leader because he solved a real problem. He, he led his country through World War II. Abraham Lincoln was a great leader, not because he came up with these pithy, um, interesting quotes, but because he led the country through a time of crisis and he solved real problems. So I realized, you know, all this talk about leadership is great, but it's not all that helpful unless it solves a problem. So real leadership is about solving real problems. And the greater the leader in history, the greater the problems that they tackled. So that led me to realize that I need to focus on helping to solve a problem. And the problem that I want to help solve is the fact that there's so many small construction businesses who are struggling to get started, struggling to survive and going out of business, as well as small construction businesses who have some measure of success and then go out of business as a result of losing their focus or losing discipline. So my, I'm going to refocus my efforts here at Construction Leading Edge, and we'll still be talking about leadership and the construction industry, but more specifically, how to help the small construction companies to get out of the struggle and build a successful business, put the systems in place that they need to, to grow their business, but then stay disciplined and stay focused so that their success doesn't put them out of commission. So they don't self-destruct like the companies that are talked about in that report that I mentioned at Construction Leading Edge uh, forward slash red flags. So the focus going forward is going to be helping small construction companies to make their business more profitable, to get out of what I call cash flow crunch, and put the systems in place to grow their business, and then maintain the discipline so that their their success doesn't kill them. Um, and I started this program. Uh, some of you may have, have seen the webinar. Um, I put together a program that I called the Construction Business Accelerator. There's a webinar at constructionleadingedge.com forward slash cash flow where I share some strategies. And I was going to sell this program, and um, but I've decided just to, to put it out there for free. This is, this is such a, a topic. There, there's so many construction companies out there struggling. And if they're struggling financially, it's going to be tough to, if you're struggling financially and you need this, this information, then it may be tough for you to pay. So I'm just going to put this stuff out there for free. And over the course of the next couple of months, I'll, I'll have a lot of these podcasts dedicated to just sharing information out of the Construction Business Accelerator, where you'll get real strategies that will help you get out of cash flow crunch mode, set up systems to make your business more sustainable, more profitable, and grow the company. And the reason I know these things work is because they're they're basically pages out of the playbook that I developed over three years where I took a construction company from about $4 million in revenue, constant chaos, constant cash flow crunch, moved it up to about $10 million in revenue, grew it um, 2x in, in size, in, in number of employees, profitability tripled, um, chaos went way down, and cash reserves were significant. So we took the business from a, a really chaotic place up to a sustainable place where it was able to grow. And basically I put together a playbook of the strategies and the, the real tactical things that we did that succeeded, things that we, we spent three years developing. So I'm gonna be sharing the, um, the, the pages out of my playbook that I call the Construction Business Accelerator. Now, I wanna tell you about you know, the other thing that, that uh, led me to this, why the success of uh, small businesses is hit so close to home with me is because back in 2002, I started a construction business and um, it, didn't, it didn't end up well. So um, there was, I remember that, what I call that day. It was one of the worst days of my life. It was in the late summer of 2004, I believe. And it was about 7.30 in the morning. I was sitting in my desk, my office, and I, I had this big, big, what I thought was a, well, it was a big problem that I was dealing with. My, one of my foremen 
had, I just learned late the previous day that one of my foremen had, had not worked for a couple of days. And he was basically, it was like he was holding himself hostage. And uh, what that also meant was he had my, my work van and my tools that I owned, he was holding him hostage. And he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to work anymore. And he wasn't going to turn it back in until something. I'm not sure what it was. I don't know if he wanted some sympathy or an audience or whatever. So basically, on that uh, that morning, I decided uh, how I was going to handle it, and I uh, called him on the next tell phone. If you remember those, the next tell two way, because he wouldn't answer, wouldn't answer the phone. He wouldn't respond. So I politely informed him, or maybe not not so politely informed him over the next tell. Mike, this is Todd. Um, you are fired. Your employment with me is over. And furthermore, you need to turn the van back in with all the tools by noon today. If it's not turned in by noon today, then the local police will come and uh, gather up my belongings and they will offer you some unique and different accommodations that go along with stealing equipment because that's basically what you're doing. So shortly thereafter, I get a phone call, found out that the van was being turned over, crisis averted, time to move forward. And then my operations manager walks in and uh, I said, his name was Michael. And I said, Michael, man, here's the deal, the van, the tools, the guy, the, we had projects to do. And he said, hold on, hold on, I gotta talk to you about something. Before, before we get into this, I gotta talk to you about something. And he proceeded to tell me how um, he was stressed out and didn't think he could do it anymore. And um, basically I cut him short and said, Michael, are you, are you walking out on me? Are you quitting? And are you giving me your notice? And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I could do this anymore. And I said, all right, um, you know, pack, your, pack your stuff up and uh, I go. So I, I had lost my, my lead guy in the field. I had lost my operations manager in the office. And I had, on top of that, I had customers, a couple of customers who decided they just weren't going to pay about 40% uh, of the, the balance of their contract. Just weren't going to pay. The work was done. No problems with the work. Just decided they weren't going to pay. They didn't feel like they needed to pay. So I would lost my my crew leader, lost my operations guy in the office. I had cash flow problems. I had bills piling up on the backside. It was a it was a disaster. I didn't know what to do. And, and ultimately, a few months later, I ended up I had to close the business down. Just shut everything down um, and dig out of the hole. So I went through the, the process of business failure. My, my, my business failed, quite frankly, and I had to shut it down and I had a gigantic disaster, gigantic mess to clean up that took a few years to clean up. So I, I know what it's like for a business to fail. I know what it feels like. I know the impact that it has on, on your, your, uh, your, your outlook on life, your well-being, I, I know how it impacts your family, how it impacts um, your your children, your relationship with your spouse, how it just it just affects you. Um, and I talked about this with Nick Balcom from Two Marines Moving on a, a recent podcast, and he, he he went through the same thing. And it it is devastating. That you can recover from it, but it's devastating. And I don't want anybody to go back go through that same thing that I did. So. Um, I want to share some strategies and techniques that I used to get out of it. So after that, after I, I shut down my business, I decided I'm going to go learn how how a, how a successful construction business works, how they do it, how do the big boys do it, because there has to be a way. It, it can't be magic. There has to be uh, a way to run a business so it's successful. So from 2005 to 2010, 2011, I worked for, I uh, managed projects for Procter & Gamble. I worked for um, large companies. I worked for small companies. Um, I worked for Fortune 50 companies, Fortune 500 companies. I, I, I moved around and I learned how successful businesses operate, the, the systems that are used on the back end to run a successful business. Because frankly, I was good at doing the work. That's why I 
I, I quit a, a job from a commercial contractor and started my own business because I wanted to do the work. I was good at doing the work, but frankly, I wasn't prepared for the business aspect of it. And that's what that's what caused my ship to go down. I, I frankly wasn't prepared or interested in the business side of it. So in 2011, I was contacted by the owner of a, a small construction company. And, and I talk about this in the cash flow webinar. Let's call him Jim. So Jim contacted me and said, hey, Todd, I want to I want to retire. I want you to come run the business for me. So I decided, hey, it's time to put these things to work. Frankly, I, I wanted to see, could I do it? Could I could I run a construction business? And it was a little bit um, a little intimidating because, um, you know, frankly, I, I didn't I didn't succeed at my business. So I'd learned a lot in the previous five years. Agreed to make the jump and come run Jim's business for him. And when we started in 2000, I believe it was 2011. Yeah, 2011. Um, the business was doing about four million in annual revenue. Had about 20 employees. Was in a constant cash flow crunch. Every week payroll was was a challenge. Unfortunately, I didn't know this, but until I showed up, I didn't know this when I signed up for the deal, and it, it was there was chaos everywhere. So fast forward to the end of 2014, about three three and a half years later, the business was doing 10 million in annual revenue, had 50 employees, um, significant cash reserves in the bank. Cash flow was not an issue. We didn't even think about cash flow. And profit margins were two to three times what they had been previously. Customers were happy. Systems were in place. Morale was good from the employees. And it was just a completely different environment. And it was a result of this playbook that I put together that I now call the Construction Business Accelerator. So one of the things I want to talk about was the the very first strategy that the very first thing we tackled was um, to maximize revenue. So I want to, the, the first strategy I want to talk about is revenue maximization because um, I remember a day in it was 2000 late 2011 a few months after I had gone to work for Jim. I was uh, driving back from a job site or driving back from a meeting with a customer and I pulled into a parking lot because I'd gotten a text message from our uh, uh, the girl who took care of our accounting and ran payroll and she said, hey, you know, what's what's going on with this payment where cash is cash flows low, cash flows tight. And <clears throat> I found out that um, we had a, a pay request that had been submitted and it just kept getting pushed off and pushed off and pushed off. We were expecting this check to show up any day now, and we found out that this huge check was was not going to show up for another month. This check that we were banking on showing up was not going to show up for another month. We didn't know how we were going to make payroll, and we scrambled around to, and, and made it work and pull, called in every favor we could and uh, pushed off every invoice we could and picked up checks by hand, whatever we could do to get to, to make it happen so we could make payroll. And we had to do that a few more times and I decided I am not gonna go through this again. Come hell or high water, we're gonna get out of cash flow crunch mode because that is no way to operate. You can't make good decisions in that situation. Uh, frankly, the owner uh, kind of, he, he kind of went off the deep end when cash flow got tight and that set off a ripple effect and it, it was just bad. So I just said, we're going to get out of cash flow crunch mode and we're going to stay out of it no matter what because we're not going to operate like this. So one of the first things I did was, uh, one of the first problems I tackled was the fact that we weren't getting, we weren't billing for every bit of work we did. Frankly, we we were doing work and not getting paid for it. Um, so I, I went about tackling that. But before I, I get into that strategy, let me let me explain the way I think about cash flow in a, a construction business. If you can imagine a imagine like a tank, like a, a steel tank, a vertical tube of a tank, and you have a, a pipe coming in at the top, and you have a pipe going out at the bottom. 
Well, the way I think of a, a business from a, a cash flow standpoint is you have um, money coming in the top, coming into this tank, flowing into this tank, and you have money flowing out the bottom of the tank. And then whatever standing, whatever water you have in that tank, the, the level that you have in that tank, those are your cash flow reserves. Now, most businesses have just enough money coming in to match what's going out, and there's no reserves in the tank. And if you, you'd like to see this, this graphically explained, see this better, go to the uh, cash flow webinar that I did at Construction Leading Edge, www.constructionleadingedge.com forward slash cash flow, and you'll be able to see this. And the problem was, in our situation, we had X number of dollars coming in every month and X, X number of dollars going out. And in some cases, we had more going out than we had coming in, and we had no reserves. We had nothing in the tank to cover the, the spikes in expenses or any sort of delays in payments, and it was constant cash flow crunch. Every week, we were struggling to make, make payroll, and it just you just can't make good decisions that way. Everybody was spending their time trying to come up with ways to get checks in into the in, into the office instead of going out and running projects proactively. It's not good. So, the first problem I tackled that I was con that I was convinced was leading to or contributing to the cash flow crunch was what I call ticket starvation, and that is doing work but not getting paid for it. Um, so what I want to talk about now is how to eliminate ticket starvation, how to maximize your revenue producing potential, get as much, get as many dollars into the tank, get as much flowing into the tank as you possibly can with the revenue producing assets you've got. And those revenue producing assets you have are your labor force, your equipment, your subcontractors, and the contracts that you have. I am not suggesting, uh, and, and I, in fact, if you're in a cash flow crunch, I would strongly recommend you don't go hire more people, you don't go bid more work, you don't go buy more equipment because you. one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever heard was when you're digging a hole, first thing you need to do is put down the shovel. So if you're in constant cash flow crunch, you've got some systemic problems that need to be solved and borrowing money, throwing money at equipment, hiring people, that sort of thing, it's not gonna help your problem, it's probably just gonna make it worse. So we want to maximize the revenue producing potential that you can that you you have already and get as much flowing into the tank as you possibly can. The first thing you want to do is make sure you're getting paid for 100% of the work you're doing. Now I'm not saying overbill. I'm not saying stick it to your customers on changes. What I'm talking about in eliminating ticket starvation is to ensure that if you do a dollar's worth of work that you get paid a dollar for that work. Because if you're a unit price contractor, especially, you need to listen up. If you're a unit price contractor, if you get paid by the linear foot of pipe, the square yard of asphalt, the square yard of sod, the cubic yard of concrete, the square foot of concrete, the linear foot of sidewalk, the uh, hour of uh, crew time, if you get paid by the unit price, if you do sewer repair, uh, asphalt repair, concrete replacement, landscaping, etc., if you if you do municipal contracts, especially, you're probably a unit price contractor. If you are a unit price contractor, you need to listen up because it's very likely that you're doing work and you're not getting paid for it, and you don't even know it. You don't even know what you're missing because. Work's getting done, it's not getting recorded properly, it's not getting billed out, and you're funding the cost of labor, equipment, material, overhead. You're donating all this stuff unknowingly because you're doing this work and you're not getting paid and you don't even know it. So I want to talk about how how to make sure you fix that. Now this there there are four, at least four different categories of ticket starvation. Okay. First category is contract work that is done but doesn't get billed out okay contract work that, that's in your contract that you do but you don't get paid for because you don't bill it out um, the second type is contract work that is work that's in your contract but never gets done and you miss out on the profit 
because you don't do the work and you don't know it. The third category of ticket starvation are changes that are requested, potentially profit producing changes that are requested, but not done because they didn't get tracked properly, therefore never got done. And the fourth category of ticket starvation is change order work that is done, but not billed for. So those four categories, contract work done, not billed for, contract work that never gets completed, change work that is requested but not done, and change order work that is done but not built out. Obviously, the work that is done but not built out, those are the most painful. We need to make sure and tackle those first. So how do we do this? How do we avoid ticket starvation? Because in a lot of cases, um, the guys go out to do the work, They're, they have an inspector in the site, on the site, and the inspector says, hey, do this, make this change, change this, add this, delete that, and there's this constant flow of information, and quite frankly, if you spend all your time trying to get approvals for this stuff, you never get anything done. The inspector in the field says, eh, I want you to add this work today, and the guys do the work, but it doesn't get reported because there's no good way to track it or report it and the work gets done and you're at the mercy of the inspector to remind you maybe that you did this work and depending on the, um, the inspector that may or may not happen. So what do we do? What do we do about this? What we did that was successful was we, we broke every project down into um, broke projects into finite work orders and we looked at a project as a, uh, a, a bunch of work orders, finite work orders, and then we looked at the billing on a daily basis. So we broke the projects down into work orders and we broke the billing down into day-by-day uh, -by -day billing per crew. Look at it on a, on a more granular, smaller bite-sized level. So what that meant was when a project came in and the type of work we did was sewer repair and rehabilitation. So we would get a, a set of plans in and we would bid on the project and we would have a contract that had uh, 50 unit prices, say replace eight inch sewer line, X dollars per linear foot, replace a sanitary lateral connection uh, X dollars each, replace, remove and replace asphalt paving, X number of dollars per square yard. And then we would have a set of plans that showed all the work that needed to be done. So what we did was we, we, we broke down those plans into work orders and we would take each line segment of sewer line, if that's what the case was, and make that a work order. Each, each activity was a work order. So in the case of uh, the type of work we did, maybe it was replace, dig and replace a 300 foot long section of eight inch sewer line. And we had a unit price for that, and then we would have a unit price, a unit price for the eight inch pipe, a unit price for each service connection, a unit price for the six inch lateral pipe, maybe a, a few other unit prices to tie the sewer lateral back into the existing, and maybe a unit price for surface restoration, whether it's concrete, asphalt, or seed and straw. So we would, each line segment was that was on the plans was turned into a work order. And that work order would have a number. And the, the best system we came up with was that the work order number what consisted of the project number, the line segment number, if there was some identifier to that on the plans, a work order number that was arbitrary, and then some sort of work identifier. If it was dig work or surface restoration work or paving work, so that we could break up, we could sort the work by the work type so we could um, determine which crew needed to do that work. And so that work order number would, would consist of 300 feet of eight inch pipe at that unit price, five or six service connections at a unit price, paving, an estimate of the paving at the unit price, and we would just build that, the, the value of that um, work on a work order and have an anticipated cost for that work order. 
Um, another way to handle this would be, let's say you were doing a, a sidewalk replacement project and you had a unit price contract to remove and replace con concrete sidewalk at X number of dollars per square foot, say. Then you would, if you had a set of plans, or even if you didn't have a set of plans, if you just had, if you were, um, if you would just get a, an email or a phone call or a text message or get handed a piece of paper with a task order, you would turn that into a work order number. Maybe the work order number would be the, the project number, the street name or the block, some sort of uh, geographical identifier of where this work's gonna be, some work order number, and then you would create the estimated price of, uh, of that work based on the unit prices that are in your contract, okay? So then you would, you would create a, some way to track and, and uh, hold all of these work orders. You could do it with a spreadsheet, um, or you could, you could create, you could do this on paper if you wanted to. You could create one piece of paper for every work order with those estimated quantities and, and do it on paper. You could do it with a spreadsheet. What we did was we found, I found a, an online database. It was actually free for a few users. Uh, this online database is at, uh, it's called Zoho, Z-O-H-O -O, Creator. You could find it at zoho.com. It's a free online database. And you can create forms, basically, to capture information. And then it houses this information in an online database um, that can be accessed from anywhere. So how this would work, how this worked for us was, as I said, we when we got a project in, we, we built it on paper, we created work orders, we turned the, the set of plans into a list of work orders. That's available in the, the backend database. Then we would print off a, like a master list of work order numbers that would be given to the guys in the field. We would laminate it and say, here's your list of work orders. And it would have some information like work order number, street, uh, type of work, something that they could refer to. And then we set up an app. What, well, we set up what looked like an app on their phone. It was simply a, a link that was on their phone's home screen or on the iPad home screen. They would we set it up so they could click an icon on their their phone or their app or on their iPad, and it would open up this form. They didn't have to log in. They didn't have to do anything else. They could select their project that they were working on. Um, select the work order number from their list that they were working on. And when they selected the work order number, all of this information, everything that that work order number consisted of, the sewer line, the service connections, the lateral piping, and the pavement, those, those bid items would pop up and the estimated quantities would pop up as well. So they didn't have to try to remember, well, what should I bill for? Is it six inch pipe? Is it eight inch pipe? Is it 12 inch pipe? Whatever. Uh, how many of these that I should, should I bill for this? Should I bill, not bill for this? It was, it, they put the work order number in and then they plugged in quantities for that, the work that was completed that day. Again, you're breaking down plans into finite work orders and you're breaking your billing down on a daily basis. So they would enter the quantities in this form of what was completed that day. If there were changes that were made, they could add additional unit prices in there. If um, the inspector asked them to do something else, they could simply uh, create a new line on that work order and put in the quantity of the work that was actually done. Um, there were also fields on this form that we used to remind them and we would ask questions like, what's the plan for tomorrow? Do you have all the material and equipment you need for tomorrow? Did you have any equipment breakdowns? Did you have any crew problems? Do you have any personnel issues? Um, and we, we would use that as reminders because every day they're filling this out at the end of the day and it would uh, prod them to, to remember, hey, what else do I need to be doing for tomorrow? Do I have enough material? Do I have enough equipment? It was just a good a good reminder. So we created this system that allowed them to understand what was actually what did success look like? What 
were the unit prices that needed to be tracked. Um, it was done on a daily basis. It gave them a mechanism for tracking changes. Um, we also, well, let's talk about changes a little bit because one of the things we struggled with was the inspectors in the field would ask them several times a week to do additional work. And it was a unit price contract, so they would direct us to do work. But again, a lot of cases, it didn't get recorded because the old under the old system, the guys would simply fill out a piece of paper with what they remembered, what they thought that they did uh, two days ago. Or at the, at the end of the week, they would try to remember what they did on Monday or Tuesday. And that was not a good situation. So what we... We, we handled this a couple different ways. If there were field changes, we, we either allowed the crew leaders to just add that work onto a work order and create their own work order, or in some cases, we created a, a simple form called a field change request form, So that and we trained all of our guys in the field. If an inspector asks you to do something and you don't have a work order number for it, it's real easy. We're happy to do it, absolutely. I just need to fill out this field change request form. It's gonna to go to the office and they're gonna get with you and get approval and they'll give me a new work order number. Which leads me to what, what happens after they would submit this form. So they would enter the information on their phone or their iPad, they would hit the submit button and then these uh, forms could be set up so that as soon as they hit the submit button, it would email that information in the report to a, a distribution list of whomever you want to. You could send it to your um, project manager, send it to the, uh, the accounting person, you could send it to the client if you wanted to do that as well. So in real time, they're getting these updates on work that's being completed as well as every time a form was submitted, that data went into an online database on the back end that could be used to run reports, go in and look at information. We would pull information out of the Zoho online database, export it into a spreadsheet where we would create our pay requests from that. We also toyed around with creating some reports in Zoho but uh, frankly, it was just a little too complicated for those of us, myself especially, who are not not coders. We we didn't we were able to to get the 80 for the 20 by just exporting the information, manipulating it in Excel, and we created some templates to make it really smooth. Um, so there there was no paper. Um, at the end of the day, there there was no there was no paper to mess with. Every bit of work was tracked. If we did work in the field, it went into a form and it was tracked. We had a record of when it was submitted, had electronic timestamp on it showing when it was completed. We eliminated any duplicate data entry. We didn't have guys in the field filling out pieces of paper, people in the office filling out paper, somebody else keying it into a spreadsheet. Um, we had great reporting we had good data if we ever had a, a, an issue with an inspector who said, I don't think you did that work that day, or I don't think you did it at all. We could just pull out the emails, we could pull out the online database and show them. And one thing I found in a dispute, he that has the most and the best documentation generally wins that dispute. So that, so the, so in a nutshell, we created a system that included an online database, which it could also be done with a spreadsheet or a piece of paper, but the keys to the system were breaking a project down into finite work orders, um, breaking the billing down on a daily basis, equipping the guys in the field with the information that they needed to know so that they could accurately track the, the billable work, the unit prices that you're really concerned about. We did not have them track every little thing that they did. If it wasn't a billable item, frankly, we weren't that concerned about it. This was about revenue maximization, eliminating ticket starvation. If they hauled 17 loads of spoils to a dump site, but we didn't get paid for that, specifically, we didn't want to know about that. We wanted, we showed our guys, these are the things that we really want to know this is what we need you to track. We set up a system to do that, gave them the information that they needed to do it. 
And the other, some of the other unexpected benefits were the guys in the field knew what was coming up. They could look at their work order list, they could look at their set of plans, and they could begin to plan what's coming next. They could sequence the job in their head, they, could, they had a good idea of what was out in front of them, and it just, it was, it was a win-win. Um, now, if you want to see more about this, I know it's, it, this is tough to understand uh, on a podcast, but if, if you're a unit price contractor and you feel like or you, you know or you think you might be suffering from ticket starvation, send me an email. If you want to find out more about this, um, send me an email, todd at constructionleadingedge.com. And if enough people are interested, if I, if I have quite a few people say, hey, I want to find out more, show me how you set up this system, then I'll do a screencast and put a video up or maybe do a webinar or something to show you, kind of walk you step by step how you can set up your own forms in Zoho Creator so you can do it yourself. Now, so that that is one of the strategies on revenue maximization. That is how I tackled ticket starvation and I can tell you the results were tremendous. Um, Our revenue went up significantly as a result of doing this without having to hire more people, which tells me that there was a lot of work being done that we didn't bill for. Um, so this was this was a huge win. Uh, there's several other revenue mac- revenue maximization strategies that I'm going to be sharing in the future, but uh, that's about all the time we have for today. So now, where do you go from here? Um, if you if you want more information like this, if you want to to be part of this movement to help small business owners in the construction industry be more successful to tackle this problem of construction businesses failing in the the first five years or failing because of their success and you want insider information like this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to join the Construction Leading Edge Nation by either going to www.constructionleadingedge.com forward slash nation or just go to constructionleadingedge.com and there's a green button on the home page that says join the CLE Nation and you'll be on the list and you'll get emails from me and get insider access uh, as we try to take over the world basically. We, we either take over the world or make it a better place. We haven't decided quite what to do there. Uh, the second thing you can do is if you want to support Construction Leading Edge, support this podcast. If you're getting value out of this podcast and you'd like to ensure that we can continue this movement, continue putting out this kind of content to help small construction business owners and and folks in the construction leadership space, now there's an opportunity for you to to, to do that, to support uh, Construction Leading Edge financially. You can go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash support and there will be opportunities there for you to support what we're doing here financially, either with one-time support donations or you can even sign up for monthly support. Um, If you're a routine listener and you wanna support what we're doing here, now you have the opportunity to do that. Lastly, if you like this stuff, I would ask you to do one of two things, or two of two things. Go to the podcast listener podcast player of your choice, Stitcher, iTunes, whatever you're listening on, and leave a review, if you would. That will move this podcast up in the rankings. It will get the word out to more people. It will make it more likely to be found by other folks like you, who hopefully would get value out of this podcast as well. And you, what I would also ask you to do is share this. Send an email to somebody, one or two people that you think would benefit from this and say, Hey, check out the constructionleadingedge.com website. Check out the Construction Leading Edge podcast. It's good stuff. I think you'll like it. So if you could do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, We've got big problems to solve here. We want to help the the small construction business owners succeed. And you know what? If you're not a construction business owner or you don't work for a small construction business, that's okay. One day you might um, and you'll need this stuff. Or maybe you're thinking about starting a business yourself. I would strongly suggest you start off smarter than I did and get a lot of this good content. Um, Or if you work for another company, the the stuff that that we're going to be talking about over these 
podcast where I, I cover the construction business accelerator strategies. These things will apply in bigger businesses as well because it's all about um, improving cash flow, improving profitability, and these principles will also help to improve the culture of your company and make it a better place to work, make it better for your employees, make it better for your clients, make it better for you. So that's it for this podcast. Until next time, this is Todd DeWalt from The Construction Leading Edge at constructionleadingedge.com. Thanks, guys.